I then returned to Boonesboro and found my men waiting for me. I told them my intentions and offered to send back to his regiment any man who feared to go with me. But everyone bravely said he would not leave me, nor surrender without my order. I then ordered them to bring out their horses, and we were soon on the road. It was a moment of thrilling interest to us all as we approached Hagerstown and lingered to hear the signal strokes of that monitor in the old church tower. At the appointed time, we had already entered into the edge of the town, with a wild shout we dashed into the streets, and the major and his fifty braves fled without firing a shot. We captured sixteen prisoners, twenty-six horses, several small arms, and a heavy army mail, which contained three important dispatches from Jeff, Davis, and two from the rebel secretary of war to General Lee. All this substantial booty we safely carried within our own lines, without the loss of a man or a horse. Many thanks are due to Dr. Zero R. Doran and Mr. Robert Thornburg for their kind and timely assistance, and also to Mrs. Susie Carson and Addie Brenner, who did so much for the comfort of our brave men. I still have in my possession some choice flowers, preserved from a bouquet presented to me by Miss Carson the evening we captured the rebel mail, and though the flowers have faded, the good deeds done by the giver will ever grow bright through coming time. All honor to the brave Union ladies. In these same streets where Captain Briggs with his telescope witnessed the successful charge of the scouting party, raged the battle hotly on the 6th of July. But as the rebel infantry was advancing with heavy artillery to the aid of Stuart's cavalry, Kilpatrick was sorely pressed and at length compelled to retire. His ears were now saluted with the sound of artillery in the direction of Williamsport, and a messenger arrived with the intelligence that General John Buford, who had advanced through the South Mountain Pass, was now attempting to destroy Lee's immense supply train, which was packed near Williamsport and not very heavily guarded. Kilpatrick desired no better work than to assist his brave comrade, and he at once hastened down the main road and soon joined Buford in the work of destruction. These combined commands were making fearful havoc in the rebel commissary and quartermaster stores. Many wagons were burned, and the whole train would have shared the same fate had not the united infantry and cavalry of the enemy come down upon us in overwhelming force. But we were not to be driven away very suddenly nor cheaply. Long and desperately we contended with the accumulating forces until darkness came on, when we found ourselves completely enveloped by the foe. Nothing but splendid generalship and true bravery on the part of our officers and men saved us from capture and destruction. Some of our number were made prisoners, but our losses were very small considering the amount of depredations we had committed and the great danger to which we were exposed. As it was, the commands were successfully withdrawn from their hazardous position, and through the darkness of the night we crossed Antietam Creek and bivouacked in safety on the opposite bank. Several prisoners were captured from the rebels during the lights of the day. They were mostly from Alabama and Louisiana regiments, and they state that their army is all together and well on its way to the river. They speak doubtfully of Lee's recrossing the Potomac. July 1st. Our cavalry is in the vicinity of Boonesboro and is acting mostly on the defensive. The enemy in force is in our front and an attack is momentarily expected. At 6 p.m., to horse was sounded throughout our camps, and after waiting two hours in rain, ready for a move, orders were received to return to our quarters. Rain is now falling in torrents, accompanied with fearful thunderings and lightnings. Unpleasant as it is, we welcome its peltings, hoping that the storm will raise the Potomac above the fording mark, and thus give Meade an opportunity to attack Lee before he has time to recross the river into Virginia. We know that his pontoons at Falling Waters have been totally destroyed by our cavalry and by the high water, and that the only ford available is at Williamsport, and hence we welcome the falling floods. Many of us have to lie down in water, which, however, is not very cold. But the night is very tedious. July 8th the sun came out bright and warm this morning, enabling us in a few moments to dry our drenched blankets and garments. 
The roads, however, abound in mud, and the streams are enormously swollen. Early in the day our pickets were driven in along the Antietam, and the enemy advanced with such force that by noon the plains around Boonesboro were the scene of a furious cavalry engagement. Dr. Moore, from whose excellent reports we have before quoted, gives the following graphic description of this cavalry duel. Buford had the right and Kilpatrick the left. The movements of the cavalry lines in this battle were among the finest sights the author remembers ever to have seen. It was here he first saw the young general, Kilpatrick, and little thought that one day the deeds he saw him perform he would transmit to paper and to posterity. Here, all day long, the rebel and the Union cavalry chiefs fought, mounted and dismounted, and striving in every manner possible to defeat and rout the other. The din and roar of battle that, from 10 a.m. until long after dark, had rolled over the plains and back through the mountains, told to the most anxious generals of them all, Meade and Lee, how desperate was the struggle. Stuart and his men fighting for the safety of the rebel army, Buford and Kilpatrick for South Mountain's narrow pass. Just as the setting sun sent his last rays over that muddy battlefield, Buford and Kilpatrick were seen rapidly approaching each other from opposite directions. They met, a few hasty words were exchanged, and away dashed Buford far off to the right, and Kilpatrick straight to the center. And in less than twenty minutes, from right to center, and from center to left, the clear notes of the bugles rang out the welcome charging, and with one long, wild shout, those glorious squadrons of Buford and Kilpatrick, from right to left as far as the eye could see, in one unbroken line, charged upon the foe. The shock was irresistible. The rebel line was broken. The routed enemy confessed the superiority of our men as they fled from the well-fought field, leaving their dead and dying behind them and our heroic chiefs led back their victorious squadrons, and while resting on their laurels, gave their brave wearied troops a momentary repose. Thus far, our cavalry had done much to obstruct the retreat of the rebel army, and had inflicted incalculable losses of men and materials. But the pursuit of our main army was not correspondingly vigorous. Two pretty good reasons may be assigned for this seeming incompetency or want of energy. The first reason is found in the fact that scarcely more than a brigade of infantry had been kept in reserve during the great and destructive Battle of Gettysburg, while the three days of struggle had well nigh exhausted our entire strength. Rest was therefore greatly needed, and a general engagement was to be guarded against. It should also be remembered that nearly one-fourth of our entire army was hors de combat. The second reason may be found in the heavy rains which fell, impeding pursuers, as one writer says, more than pursued, though they need not. But the retreating army has this advantage. It usually chooses its own route, which it can generally cover or hide by means of stratagem, so that it requires time as well as study to effectually pursue. Perhaps a third reason for our tardiness of pursuit should be presented. Does it not appear to be an overruling act of providence? Had General Meade advanced, as it seems he might have done with the resources at his command, against the demoralized, decimated, and flying army, with its ammunition quite exhausted, and a swollen river, unfordable and bridgeless, between it and Safiti, Lee could not have escaped an elation, but the public sentiment of the country, though forming and improving rapidly, was not yet prepared for such a victory. We needed to spend more treasure, spill more blood, sacrifice more precious lives, to lift us up to those heights of public and political virtue, where we could be safely entrusted with so dear a boon. We were not then prepared for peace, that sovereign balm for a nation's woes. The tardiness with which our movements were made enabled the enemy to reach a good position near Hagerstown, which he began to fortify in such a manner as to cover his crossing. Meantime, we understood that successful efforts were made to rebuild the bridge at Falling Waters. General Meade, in his official report, gives the following account of his pursuit. The 5th and 6th of July were employed in succoring the wounded and burying the dead. Major General Sedgwick, commanding the 6th Corps, having pushed the pursuit of the enemy as far as the Fairfield Pass and the mountains, and reporting that the pass was very strong, 
one in which a small force of the enemy could hold in check and delay for a considerable time. Any pursuing force? I determined to follow the enemy by a flank movement, and accordingly, leaving McIntosh's brigade of cavalry and Neal's brigade of infantry to continue harassing the enemy, I put the army in motion for Middletown, and orders were immediately sent to Major General French at Frederick to reoccupy Harper's Ferry and send a force to occupy Turner's Pass in South Mountains. I subsequently ascertained that Major General French had not only anticipated these orders in part, but had pushed a cavalry force to Williamsport and Falling Waters, where they destroyed the enemy's pontoon bridge and captured its guard. Buford was at the same time sent to Williamsport and Hagerstown. The duty above assigned to the cavalry was most successfully accomplished, the enemy being greatly harassed, his trains destroyed, and many captures of guns and prisoners made. July 10th This morning, at five o'clock, the cavalry advanced from Boonesboro, passed through Keatesville, and crossed the Antietam about ten o'clock. At twelve o'clock, we engaged the enemy at Jones Cross Roads. The Harris Light led the advance, dismounted, the rebels were driven three consecutive times from as many positions which they had chosen. Their resistance was by no means strong nor determined. Before night, Buford moved his command to Sharpsburg, on the extreme left of our lines, and Kilpatrick advanced to a position on the extreme right, in the vicinity of Hagerstown, where he covered the road to Gettysburg. On the eleventh, only picket skirmishes occupied the time, but on the twelfth, Kilpatrick, supported by a brigade of infantry under the command of Brigadier General Ames of Howard's Corps, advanced upon the enemy near Hagerstown, drove them from their works, and then out of the streets of the city, and took permanent possession. This successful movement greatly contracted our lines, and brought our forces into a better position. At the close of this enterprise, as we are informed, General Meade called a council of war, at which was discussed earnestly and long the propriety of attacking the enemy. Notwithstanding the anxiety of the chief commander to advance and reap fully the fruit of Gettysburg, five of his corps commanders, out of eight, argued against the measure, and as Meade did not desire to assume the grave responsibility of a movement against such protests, no move was immediately attempted. This statement may modify the condemnatory judgments which were formed against General Meade, and may prepare our minds rightly to interpret General A. P. Howe's report of the general pursuit. In narrating its spirit and progress, he says, On the 4th of July it seemed evident enough that the enemy were retreating. How far they were gone we could not see from the front. We could see but a comparatively small force from the position where I was. On Sunday the 5th and 6th Corps moved in pursuit. As we moved, a small rear guard of the enemy retreated. We followed them, with this small rear guard of the enemy before us, up to Fairfield, in a gorge of the mountains. There we again waited for them to go on. There seemed to be no disposition to push this rear guard when we got up to Fairfield. A lieutenant from the enemy came into our lines and gave himself up. He was a Northern Union man in service in one of the Georgia regiments, and without being asked, he unhesitatingly told me, when I met him as he was being brought in, that he belonged to the artillery of the rear guard of the enemy, and that they had but two rounds of ammunition with the rear guard. But we waited there without receiving any orders to attack. It was a place where, as I informed General Sedgwick, we could easily attack the enemy with advantage. But no movement was made by us until the enemy went away. Then one brigade of my division, with some cavalry, was sent to follow after them, while the remainder of the Sixth Corps moved to the left. We moved on through Boonesboro and passed up on the Pike Road leading to Hagerstown. After passing Boonesboro, it became my turn to lead the Sixth Corps. That day, just before we started, General Sedgwick ordered me to move on and take up the best position I could over a little stream on the Frederick side of Funkstown. As I moved on, it was suggested to me by him to move carefully. Don't come into contact with the enemy. We don't want to bring on a general engagement. It seemed to be the current impression that it was not desired to bring on a general engagement. 
I moved on until we came near Funkstown. General Buford was along that way with his cavalry. I had passed over the stream referred to and found a strong position which I concluded to take, and wait for the Sixth Corps to come up. In the meantime, General Buford, who was in front, came back to me and said, I am pretty hardy engaged here. I have used a great deal of my ammunition. It is a strong place in front. It is an excellent position. It was a little farther out than I was, near Funkstown. He said, I have used a great deal of my ammunition, and I ought to go to the right. Suppose you move up there or send up a brigade or even a part of one and hold that position. Said I, I will do so at once if I can just communicate with General Sedgwick. I am ordered to take up a position over here and hold it, and the intimation conveyed to me was that they did not want to get into a general engagement. I will send for General Sedgwick and ask permission to hold that position and relieve you. I accordingly sent a staff officer to General Sedgwick with a request that I might go up at once and assist General Buford, stating that he had a strong position, but his ammunition was giving out. General Buford remained with me until I should get an answer. The answer was, no, we do not want to bring on a general engagement. Well, said I, Buford, what can I do? He said, they expect me to go farther to the right. My ammunition is pretty much out. That position is a strong one, and we ought not to let it go. I sent down again to General Sedgwick, stating the condition of General Buford, and that he would have to leave unless he could get some assistance, that his position was not far in front, and that it seemed to me that we should hold it, and I should like to send some force up to picket it at least. After a time I got a reply that if General Buford left I might occupy the position. General Buford was still with me, and I said to him, If you go away from there, I will have to hold it. That's all right, said he. I will go away. He did so, and I moved right up. It was a pretty good position when you cover your troops. Soon after relieving Buford, we saw some rebel infantry advancing. I do not know whether they brought them from Hagerstown or from some other place. They made three dashes, not in heavy force, upon our line to drive us back. The troops that happened to be there on our line were what we considered in the Army of the Potomac unusually good ones. They quietly repulsed the rebels twice, and the third time they came up they sent them flying into Funkstown, yet there was no permission to move on and follow up the enemy. We remained there some time, until we had orders to move on and take a position a mile or more nearer Hagerstown, as we moved up, we saw that the rebels had some light field works, hurriedly thrown up, apparently, to cover themselves while they recrossed the river. I think we remained there three days, and the third night, I think, after we got up into that position, it was said the rebels recrossed the river. July 12th I had the misfortune to be kicked off my pins last night, just before we were relieved at the front. Approaching my sorrel pony from the rear, in a careless manner, for he could not see me until I got within short range, he raised his heels very suddenly, and without ceremony, planted them in my breast, laying me, not in the most gentle manner, flat upon the ground. Medical aid is considered necessary today, as I am suffering not a little, but as the accident was purely the result of my own folly, I hope to endure my pains with becoming patience. Today I found the following dispatches in some northern paper, and I record them to show what contradictory reports will often find their way into the public press concerning men and measures. Mountain House, near Boonesboro, July 9th. There has been no fighting this morning. The fight of yesterday, near Boonesboro, was between Generals Buford and Kilpatrick's cavalry and rebel infantry, principally on the bushwhacking style. Our troops fell back early in the day, but subsequently reoccupied the ground. Artillery was most effectually used on both sides in this engagement. There is no truth in the reported death of General Kilpatrick. Boonesboro, July 9th, 8 p.m. There have been no active operations on our front today. After the cavalry fight of yesterday, the enemy drew in their forces towards Hagerstown, 
and formed a line on elevated ground from Funkstown on the right to the bend of the river below Williamsport on the left, thus uncovering the Shepherdstown crossing. Scouts and reconnoitering parties report that Lee is entrenching his front and drawing from his train on the Virginia side and making general preparations for another battle. It is contradicted tonight that we have a force on General Lee's line of retreat in Virginia. July 13th. All has been quiet along our lines today. The army, being pretty well rested by this time, is waiting impatiently for the command to advance. Our position is also a good one, though not better than that of the enemy. We have every reason to believe that the rebel army is still on the north bank of the Potomac. The recent rains have raised the river above the fording mark. However, Lee will undoubtedly fall back into Virginia if he finds a good opportunity. During the latter part of the day, General Meade finally decided to assault the position of the invaders. Very much to the delight of the rank and file of the army, orders were promulgated to the effect that a strong and simultaneous advance must be made early on the morning of the 14th. Preparations were immediately begun. Kilpatrick and his cavalry were sent out on picket and advanced as near the enemy's lines as it was prudent. Not many hours of the night had passed away when Kilpatrick discovered certain movements which indicated that the enemy was leaving his front. Prepared as he was to attack them by the morning light, he was ready to follow up any movement which they might make. Hence, at three o'clock on the morning of the 14th, his advance guard moved forward upon the retiring enemy. While information of this unexpected movement of the enemy was dispatched to General Meade, Kilpatrick advanced towards Williamsport with his usual rapidity and power, driving and capturing everything before him. Informed by citizens that the rear guard of the retreating army had but a few moments before started from the river, he followed closely in their tracks and struck them at falling waters, where, after a brilliant and sharp conflict, he bagged a large number of prisoners. Many a poor fellow never reached the long-looked-for Virginia shore. General Meade then sent the following dispatch to Washington. Headquarters Army of the Potomac, July 14, 3 p.m. H.W. Halleck, General-in-Chief. My cavalry now occupy falling waters, having overtaken and captured a brigade of infantry, 1,500 strong, two guns, two caissons, two battle flags, and a large number of small arms. The enemy are all across the Potomac. George G. Meade, Major General. Later in the day, he sent the following. Headquarters Army of the Potomac, July 14, 8.30 p.m. Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief. My cavalry have captured 500 prisoners in addition to those previously reported. General Pettigrew of the Confederate Army was killed this morning in the attack on the enemy's rearguard. His body is in our hands. G. G. Meade, Major General. These dispatches were afterward denied by General Lee in a letter to his authorities, as follows. Headquarters Army of Northern Virginia, July 1863. General S. Cooper, Adjutant and Inspector General G. S. A. General. I have seen in the Northern papers what purports to be an official dispatch from General Meade, stating that he had captured a brigade of infantry, two pieces of artillery, two caissons, and a large number of small arms, as this army retired to the south bank of the Potomac on the 13th and 14th instant. This dispatch has been copied into the Richmond papers, and as its official character may cause it to be believed, I desire to state that it is incorrect. The enemy did not capture any organized body of men on that occasion, but only stragglers, and such as were left asleep on the road, exhausted by the fatigue and exposure of one of the most inclement nights I have ever known at this season of the year. It rained without cessation, rendering the road by which our troops marched toward the bridge at Falling Waters very difficult to pass, and causing so much delay that the last of the troops did not cross the river at the bridge until 1 a.m. on the morning of the 14th. While the column was thus detained on the road, a number of men, worn down with fatigue, laid down in barns and by the roadside, and though officers were sent back to arouse them as the troops moved on, the darkness and rain prevented them from finding all, and many were in this way left behind. 
two guns were left on the road, the horses that drew them became exhausted, and the officers went back to procure others. When they returned, the rear of the column had passed the guns so far that it was deemed unsafe to send back for them, and they were thus lost. No arms, cannon, or prisoners were taken by the enemy in battle, but only such as were left behind, as I have described, under the circumstances. The number of stragglers thus lost I am unable to state with accuracy, but it is greatly exaggerated in the dispatch referred to. I am with great respect your obedient servant, R. E. Lee, General. This was evidently an attempt on the part of the rebel leader to disparage our victories and to wipe out of his record, with a sort of ledger domain, the disgraceful and disastrous denouement of his invasion. In the following important statement, General Meade confirms his position by incontestable facts and shows how the matter stood. Headquarters Army of the Potomac, Agge, 1863, Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief. My attention has been called to what purports to be an official dispatch of General R. E. Lee, commanding the rebel army, to General S. Cooper, adjutant and inspector general, denying the accuracy of my telegram to you of July 14th, announcing the result of the cavalry affair at Falling Waters. I have delayed taking any notice of Lee's report until the return of Brigadier General Kilpatrick, absent on leave, who commanded the cavalry on the occasion referred to, and on whose report from the field my telegram was based. I now enclose the official report of Brigadier General Kilpatrick, made after his attention had been called to Lee's report. You will see that he reiterates and confirms all that my dispatch averred, and proves most conclusively that General Lee has been deceived by his subordinates, or he would never, in the face of the facts now alleged, have made the assertion his report claims. It appears that I was in error in stating that the body of General Pettigrew was left in our hands, although I did not communicate that fact until an officer from the field reported to me he had seen the body. It is now ascertained from the Richmond papers that General Pettigrew, though mortally wounded in the affair, was taken to Winchester, where he subsequently died. The three battle flags captured on this occasion and sent to Washington belonged to the 40th, 47th, and 55th Virginia regiments of infantry. General Lee will surely acknowledge these were not left in the hands of stragglers asleep in barns. George G. Meade, Major General Commanding Kilpatrick, in his letter of explanation, referred to in the above dispatch, gives the following graphic account of this last scene in the great drama of the invasion. Headquarters, 3rd Division Cavalry Corps, Warrenton Junction, Vayner's Og To Colonel A.J. Alexander, Chief of Staff of Cavalry Corps, Colonel In compliance with a letter just received from the headquarters of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac, directing me to give the facts connected with the fight at Falling Waters, I have the honor to state that, at 3 a.m. of the 14th Ultimo, I learned that the enemy's pickets were retiring in my front. Having been previously ordered to attack at 7 a.m., I was ready to move at once. At daylight I had reached the crest of hills occupied by the enemy an hour before, and a few minutes before six, General Custer drove the rear guard of the enemy into the river at Williamsport, Learning from citizens that a portion of the enemy had retreated in the direction of falling waters, I at once moved rapidly for that point and came up with this rear guard of the enemy at 7.30 a.m., at a point two miles distant from falling waters. We pressed on, driving them before us, capturing many prisoners and one gun. When within a mile and a half of falling waters, the enemy was found in large force, drawn up in line of battle on the crest of a hill, commanding the road on which I was advancing. His left was protected by earthworks, and his right extended to the woods on our left. The enemy was, when first seen, in two lines of battle, with arms stacked within less than one thousand yards of the large force. A second piece of artillery, with its support, consisting of infantry, was captured while attempting to get into position. The gun was taken to the rear. A portion of the 6th Michigan Cavalry, seeing only that portion of the enemy behind the earthworks, charged. 
This charge was led by Major Weber and was the most gallant ever made. At a trot he passed up the hill, received the fire from the whole line, and the next moment rode through and over the earthworks, and passed to the right, sabring the rebels along the entire line, and returned with a loss of thirty killed, wounded, and missing, including the gallant Major Weber, killed. I directed General Custer to send forward one regiment as skirmishers. They were repulsed before support could be sent them, and driven back, closely followed by the rebels, until checked by the 1st Michigan and a squadron of the 8th New York. The 2nd Brigade having come up, it was quickly thrown into position and, after a fight of two hours and thirty minutes, routed the enemy at all points and drove him toward the river. When within a short distance of the bridge, General Buford's command came up and took the advance. We lost twenty-nine killed, thirty-six wounded, and forty missing. We found upon the field one hundred and twenty-five dead rebels and brought away upward of fifty wounded. A large number of the enemy's wounded were left upon the field in charge of their own surgeons. We captured two guns, three battle flags, and upward of fifteen hundred prisoners. To General Custer and his brigade, Lieutenant Pennington and his battery, and one squadron of the 8th New York Cavalry of General Buford's command, all praise is due. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, J. Kilpatrick, Brigadier General. In his official report of operations from the 28th of June, when he assumed command of the 3rd Division, Kilpatrick says, In this campaign my command has captured 4,500 prisoners, 9 guns, and 11 battle flags. Never before in the history of warfare has it been permitted to any man commanding a division to include, in a report of about forty-five days' operations, such magnificent results. As the last foot of the invaders disappeared from the soil where they had never been successful, our gallant boys built their bivouac fires and rested themselves and their weary animals near the scene of their recent victory. The telegraph lines, which had so often been burdened with news of disaster, now sang with joyful intelligence from all departments of our vast armies. Gettysburg was soon followed by Vicksburg, then Port Hudson, the names being emblazoned upon many a glowing transparency to the honor of the heroes who had planned and the braves who had fought so successfully and well. The news was welcomed with salutes of artillery and bonfires in most of the northern cities and villages, while the whole mass of our people was jubilant and rejoicing. On the 15th, the President issued a proclamation of thanksgiving, in which he recognized the hand of God in our victories, and called upon the people to render the homage due to the divine majesty for the wonderful things he has done in the nation's behalf, and to invoke the influence of his Holy Spirit to subdue the anger which has produced and so long sustained a needless and cruel rebellion. In the midst of these rejoicings we end our chapter. Chapter 14. Kilpatrick's Gunboat Expedition This sudden and masterly movement of the rebels was a cutting surprise to General Meade, and a source of mortification and chagrin to all. Gloriously successful as we had been, it was evident that hesitation and indecision had greatly detracted from our laurels. We had won a world-renowned victory, but we had failed to reap all the legitimate fruits which our situation placed within our reach. General Lee had been terribly punished, but his escape was quite marvelous. One writer says, When his shattered columns commenced their retreat from Gettysburg, Few of his officers can have imagined that they would ever reach Virginia with their artillery and most of their trains. And though their trains were severely handled and greatly injured, yet the old rebel army of northern Virginia, with nearly all its artillery, made its exit from soil too sacred to freedom for a rebel victory. Their losses, however, had been immense, and they were only too glad to escape in a manner very unlike the audacious way in which they had advanced but a few weeks previous into the northern states. It now became the policy of our leader to follow the fugitives as closely as the changed circumstances of affairs would permit, and to give the rebels no rest while he endeavored to press them determinedly and watched them by means of scouts and signal stations with a jealous eye. 
There is, however, a limit to the endurance which men and horses are capable of, and beyond this the overtaxed powers give way, and exhausted nature claims her rights. Few there are except those who have had experience, who know how much privation the brave soldier and his general suffer in the toils of the field, on the rapid march, the hasty bivouac, the broken slumbers, the wakeful watchings, and the scanty fare. It must be remembered also that our army had made many forced marches, describing in its route a line somewhat resembling the circumference of a great circle, as a careful survey of the map of movements will show. While the route of the enemy, who had several days the start of us, was more like the diameter of that circle. Our cavalry had not only fought and defeated the rebel cavalry on many sanguinary fields, but it had met the serried lines of their infantry also, as at Gettysburg, where the brave Farnsworth fell. Owing to this fatigue of our forces, our pursuit of the enemy was not as vigorous, it would seem at a cursory glance as it should have been. As soon as it was ascertained that the rebel army was in full retreat, a force of our cavalry was sent across the Potomac at Harper's Ferry, bivouacking, the night of the 14th of July on Bolivar Heights. Early the next morning we advanced on the Winchester Turnpike as far as Halltown, where we deflected to the right on the road to Shepherdstown. We had not proceeded far before we encountered the enemy's cavalry under Fitzhugh Lee, with which we were soon involved in a spirited contest. At first our troopers were worsted and driven back a short distance, but having found a good position, we rallied and repulsed several desperate charges, inflicting heavy losses, until the rebels were glad to give up the game and consequently retired. Colonel Drake, 1st Virginia, and Colonel Gregg, were among the rebels slain, while on our side the highest officer killed was Captain Fisher of the 16th Pennsylvania. The fighting was done principally on foot. While these things were transpiring, Kilpatrick moved his division from Falling Waters to Boonesboro by way of Williamsport and Hagerstown. Sad evidences of the recent battles and marches in dead animals and general debris were seen all along the way. Having reached our bivouac near Boonesboro, our men and horses came to their rations and rest with a wonderful relish. During the day we have been reading of the murderous riots made in northern cities, especially in New York, where men in mobs have ostensibly leagued against the authority of the government. The bloody accounts are stirring the rank and file of our army terribly. A feeling of intense indignation exists against traitorous demagogues, who are undoubtedly at the bottom of all this anarchy. Detachments from many of the old regiments are now being sent north to look after northern traitors. This depletion of our ranks we cannot well afford, for every available man is needed in the field. Many of our regiments are much reduced. The Harris Light now musters but one hundred men fit for duty, scarcely one-tenth the number with which we entered upon the campaign. Our horses are also much used up. Hundreds of them have been killed and wounded in battle, and not a few have played out, so that they are utterly unserviceable. The author of these records has worn out completely two horses since he had a second horse shot under him in the cavalry fight near Upperville. July 16th. Boots and saddles sounded at four o'clock, and before daylight we were on our way toward Harper's Ferry. We revisited Rohrersville, crossed Crampton's Gap, and at last reached the Potomac at Berlin, where the division was separated, a portion of it moving to Harper's Ferry, where they bivouacked at night in the yard of the destroyed United States arsenal. Pontoons at Harper's Ferry and Berlin were used for crossing the army into Virginia. The crossing was being effected as rapidly as possible, yet for so vast an army it is always slow and tedious. Our troops are daily crossing and advancing, but all is otherwise quiet. We are now receiving an issue of clothing which we greatly need. Our ranks are putting on a new revived appearance. The first sergeants of the Harris Light have received orders to finish their payrolls. General Lee is reported to be falling back to the Rappahannock. Sunday, July 19th. Our cavalry left Harper's Ferry at 2 o'clock p.m., crossed the river on pontoons at Sandy Hook, and advanced into Virginia. 
Monthly returns for June were made before our march commenced. The weather is very warm and sultry. On the 20th, we resumed our march at 10 a.m. and advanced to Leesburg, where we fed our horses and rested. In the decline of the day, we marched to Goose Creek, on whose grassy banks we bivouacked for the night. The whole cavalry force is moving towards the Rappahannock. On the 21st, we advanced via Gwynn Spring and Centerville to Manassas Junction. The boys have had some gay times today after blackberries, which we found in great abundance all along our line of march. General Gregg was compelled to dismount several men in the forenoon and ordered them to march on foot for the offense of leaving the ranks for berries, without permission. A command would soon be totally demoralized if such tendencies to unsoldierly conduct were not checked. And though at times discipline seems severe, yet to an army, it is absolutely necessary. On the 20th, Kilpatrick's division marched to the vicinity of Gainesville. We fell in with Scott's 900 as we were marching across the field of Bull Run, among whom we found several acquaintances with whom we spent an hour pleasantly. July 23rd. Our command was cheered today by the arrival of a large mail, which brought a message to nearly every man. During active campaigning, as in the invasion of Pennsylvania and Maryland, it is difficult to keep up postal connections with the civil world, and with the very best efforts which can be made, our mails are greatly delayed, sometimes even for weeks together. But when they do come, they are hailed with a delight which is almost frantic. The post boys are cheered as far as they can be seen, as they wend their way from camp to camp with their horses loaded down with the enormously swollen mail bags. Several bushels of letters are sometimes brought by one carrier, as was the case today. During the day we have heard very heavy cannonading in the direction of White Plains. It appears that General Meade, misled by the information brought by some of his scouts, expected to engage the rebel army in Manassas Gap, or west of that where General Buford found the enemy in force, our army was accordingly concentrated upon this point. The Third Corps, under General French, which occupied Ashby's Gap, was sent forward rapidly to Buford's support, where its first division, commanded by General Hobart Ward, pushed through the gap, driving the enemy before it, but with mutual loss. Here the New York Excelsior Brigade, General F. B. Spinola commanding, greatly distinguished itself by making three heroic charges up the frowning steeps, where the rebels were strongly posted. Their general was twice wounded, but the effort was a success. On the morning of the 24th, our soldiers pushed forward as far as Front Royal, but found no enemy. They then learned that they had been fighting only a portion of Lee's rear guard, which in the night had slipped away in the trail of their main army southward. By this move, General Meade's army lost about two days' march, and when again we reached the bank of the Rappahannock, the old foe was facing us in threatening attitude from the opposite shore. This afternoon the Harris Light was sent on a scout to Thoroughfare Gap. From the heights beyond the gap we saw the wagon train of the 11th Corps moving toward Warrenton. This was a portion of the force which had expected a fight at Manassas Gap. July 25th. Our cavalry force reached the vicinity of Warrenton Junction when we went into bivouac. The second squadron of our regiment, under Captain O. J. Downing, moved to Thoroughfare Gap and returned to Gainesville, where it joined the regiment, and then marched with us to the junction via Bristow and Catlett's. Before night we were sent out on picket in the vicinity of Catlett's Station, where we relieved the 1st Virginia Cavalry. We continued on picket through the 26th, but all was quiet along the lines. An inspection of horses was made this morning, when a large number were condemned as utterly unserviceable, and they were started off toward Washington to be exchanged for better ones. July 27th. I have the responsibility and honor of being in command of a company. This afternoon a detachment of our forces was sent out on a sort of bushwhacking expedition. A portion of Company F was captured by the 4th Virginia Cavalry while patrolling the road near Bristersburg. We are not doing much these days except picketing, scouting, recruiting, resting. On the 29th, our entire brigade was marched to within three miles of Warrenton and then countermarched to the old camp, 
and on the last day of the month we advance to Warrington in heavy force, where General Meade has had his headquarters for several days. August 1st. Today General Meade moved his headquarters to Rappahannock Station. The heat is excessive. Two men of the Harris Light were sunstruck during the day. We left Warrington at 7 o'clock a.m. and moved very slowly. At night, we bivouacked not far from New Baltimore. On the following day, we were sent out on picket, which here is neither difficult nor dangerous. Our colonel, Otto Harhouse, is ill and is awaiting his documents for a leave of absence from the regiment. August 3rd. The colonel received his papers today and started forthwith for New York. Captain L. H. Southard, the senior officer, is in command. The regiment was sent to Thoroughfare Gap, where we encamped in an apple orchard. Our infantry lines now extend down the Rappahannock as far as Fredericksburg, which we hold. The cavalry is picketing and patrolling all this territory. However, as there are so many regiments to engage in this work, the duty is comparatively light. Many hands make light work. Sunday, August 9th. We still continue near Thoroughfare Gap. Occasionally, as our turn comes, we picket along the Manassas Gap Railroad. Major E. F. Cook, who has been absent for some time, returned to us today and took command. My old company, E., shows the following report. Present, 32. Fit for duty, 22. On Monday, the regiment left camp at 9 a.m., and, separating into several detachments, moved upon White Plains and Middleburg from different directions. These places have been occupied for some time past by Mosby's guerrilla bands. We did not succeed, however, in bringing them into an engagement, as they were sharply on the lookout and studiously kept beyond the reach of our carbines. Occasionally our pickets are attacked by them, and some lively times are experienced. August 13th I was detailed by the adjutant this morning to act as Sergeant Major in place of Sergeant Temple, who is assigned to the command of a company. Very few commissioned officers are with the regiment at present. This leaves the command of several companies to enlisted men. Some of our officers are out on detached service, while not a few, during the lull of army operations, have asked and received leaves of absence and are visiting their friends in the north. It might indeed be said that we are all rusticating, and, were it not for the guerrilla bands that infest the country, attacking our outposts, and frequently disturbing our lines of communication with our bases of supply as well as the outer world, our condition would be one of pleasing rest. On the fourteenth a little excitement was afforded us, to relieve us from the monotonous life which we are spending. A detachment of the regiment, commanded by Captain Griggs, made a bold dash upon an ill-starred portion of Mosby's band near Aldi, where we captured three men and twenty horses and equipments, most of which had formerly belonged to our service, having been taken by these wily guerrillas. Nearly every horse had the familiar U.S. seats upon his shoulder, and the saddles, with very few exceptions, were of northern manufacture. August 15th. The Harris Light, moved from Thoroughfare Gap at 10 a.m. We reached Hartwood Church at 8 in the evening via New Baltimore and Greenwich. A considerable halt was made at Warrenton Junction, where we drew rations and forage. Henry E. Davies, Jr., just promoted to the colonelcy of the regiment, joined us at the junction and took command. He is immensely popular with the men, especially with those who admire bravery and heroism, and who covet to be thoroughly drilled and disciplined. August 16th. We continue at Hartwood Church, with our camp located very near General Kilpatrick's headquarters. During the day, Colonel Davies appointed me second lieutenant and assigned me to the command of Company M, as both the captain and first lieutenant of the company are absent on detached service. Late in the evening, I received orders to report, with my company, at an early hour next day, to Captain Meade, Division Quartermaster. At five o'clock on the morning of the 18th, we made our bow to the captain, who dispatched us as an escort or guard to a train from Hartwood to Warrenton Junction. 
During the march, we made an exciting dash upon a band of guerrillas who were in ambush for us, expecting to make some captures. But they were disappointed, for we were not only prepared to resist them but would have captured them but for the superior fleetness of their horses. After accomplishing the work we were sent out to do and resting one night, we returned to the regiment. August 22nd. This is my natal day. I find myself twenty-two years of age. I am not surrounded on this anniversary, as in former years, by the friends of my childhood. But memories of the past come trooping up in such vivid lines as to make the day one of deep interest. August 28th. My company, which forms a part of Captain Mitchell's battalion, is doing picket duty at present with the battalion on the Rappahannock between Banks and United States Fords. My company is at the captain's headquarters and acts as grand guard. Sunday, August 30th. Today I accompanied the division and brigade officers of the day in their visit to and inspection of the pickets along the Rappahannock. Our ride was very pleasant. Captain Barker, of the 5th New York Cavalry, dined with Captain Mitchell and myself. He is a lively companion, was in the hands of Mosby last spring and has a fund of amusing and interesting incidents of army life with which to enliven his conversation. On the last day of August, Captain Mitchell was ordered to report to the regiment at Hartwood Church with his reserves. The pickets are to remain on the river until attacked by the enemy or recalled by orders from division headquarters. September 4th. To break the monotony of picketing and to subserve the cause of freedom, a most novel scheme was lately undertaken known as Kilpatrick's gunboat expedition. The object was to destroy a portion of the rebel navy anchored in the Rappahannock near Port Conway, opposite Port Royal. This peculiar kind of warfare, which required genius and dash, was waged by the troopers with complete success, and they returned to their bivouac fires to enliven the weary hours with stories of their long march down the river and their destructive charge upon the gunboats of the enemy. The expedition set out about two o'clock on the morning of September 1st. Dr. Lucius P. Woods, Surgeon-in-Chief of the 1st Brigade, 3rd Division, gives the following interesting description of the above raid in a letter to Mrs. Woods. I returned yesterday after a three days expedition after gunboats. We all laughed at the order sending cavalry after such craft, but I am happy to say that the object of the expedition was accomplished. We left camp at two o'clock a.m., marched all day and all the following night till three o'clock next morning, when we made a furious charge upon rebel infantry. They ran so fast as to disarrange the general's plan of attack. The morning was so dark that we could not see one rod in advance. We captured twelve or fifteen prisoners, and General Kilpatrick gave orders in their hearing to have the whole command fall back, stating that the gunboats would be alarmed and the expedition be a failure. The general took particular pains to allow half the prisoners to escape and to get across the Rappahannock. After falling back two miles, we were countermarched toward the river, near which we were formed in line of battle. We sat there on our horses waiting for daylight. Then the flying artillery of ten guns, supported by the old 5th New York and 1st Michigan, dashed at a full run down to the river bank, wheeled into position, and gave the rebels a small cargo of hissing cast iron, which waked them up more effectually than their ordinary morning call. They soon came to their senses, and for half an hour sent over to us what I should think to be, by the noise they made, tea kettles, cooking stoves, large cast iron hats, etc. But our smaller and more active guns soon silenced theirs, and drove the gunners away, when we turned our attention to the boring of holes in their boats with conical pieces of iron, vulgarly called solid shot. I am sure I can recommend them as first-class augers, for they sank the boats in time for all hands to sit down to breakfast at half-past nine o'clock. The repast consisted of muddy water, rusty salt pork, and half a hard cracker, termed by us an iron-clad breakfast. We were absent from camp three days and had only nine hours sleep. Further interesting particulars were given in a New York daily as follows. The expedition under General Kilpatrick, sent out a few days since to recapture, in conjunction with the Navy, 
the gunboats Satellite and Reliance, which recently fell into the hands of the rebels, was, so far as the cavalry is concerned, successful. On Tuesday evening, General Kilpatrick arrived on this side the river at Port Conway and brilliantly dashed upon the enemy's pickets under Colonel Lowe. The rebels did not even make a show of resistance but rushed into a number of flatboats in the wildest confusion and landed safely on the opposite bank. If they had made a show of fight, they would have most likely been captured. After the escape of the enemy, General Kilpatrick waited two hours for the cooperation of the Navy, which is understood to have been agreed upon. The vessels did not arrive, and General Kilpatrick ordered a battery to open fire upon the gunboats Reliance and Satellite. This was done at the distance of 650 yards. The enemy immediately abandoned the gunboats, very fortunately for themselves, for only a few moments elapsed before the satellite was in a sinking condition and the reliance rendered useless. Both boats were completely riddled by shot and shell. The force under Kilpatrick consisted of cavalry and two batteries of artillery. The satellite is sunk and the Reliance so completely disabled as to be beyond hope of being repaired by the rebels. On our return from Port Conway, we passed through Falmouth, where we halted a short time. It was pleasant to survey the scenes of former labors and conflicts. Much alarm appears to have been created among the rebels by our gunboat disturbance. A large force of rebel cavalry can be distinctly seen approaching Fredericksburg on the Telegraph Road, and more or less commotion prevails across the river. From Falmouth, we marched directly to Hartwood Church. On arriving here, Captain Mitchell's battalion was ordered back to its old position on picket to relieve the infantry which took our places before the expedition to Port Conway. September 5th, we continue on picket near United States Ford. This morning, the regiment was mustered in for pay by Major Melvin, who is temporarily in command, Colonel Davies having been placed in command of a brigade. At 10 o'clock a.m., I received my commission of second lieutenant. It was brought from the headquarters of the regiment by the bugler of Company H. It dates from the cavalry fight at Aldi, which occurred on the 17th of June. On this line of pickets, we have continued uninterruptedly for a week. On the 7th, Colonel Davies, with his assistant adjutant general, visited our post. It was very gratifying to Captain Mitchell and myself to receive the colonel's compliments for promptness and vigilance in our work, especially as he has the reputation of never bestowing praise where it is not deserved. I rode down to Lieutenant Temple's picket reserve at Richard's Ferry on the 8th. I found the lieutenant in excellent humor, but decidedly opposed to picketing as a permanent occupation. We were, however, consoled with the hope of relief ere long. In the afternoon, the brigade officer of the day called at the bivouac of the Grand Guard and expressed himself as being highly pleased with the disposition and management of the pickets. The enemy's pickets confront ours at all the fords of the river and appear in heavy force. For some time past, we have understood that General Lee's headquarters are at Orange Court House, while his infantry occupies the south banks and bluffs of the Rapidan. Stewart occupies Culpeper Courthouse and pickets and patrols the territory between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock, a region shaped much like an old-fashioned harrow. September 13th. An advance of the Union Army was ordered yesterday by its chief, in which the cavalry was to take a prominent part. Orders were issued accordingly last evening, and every needed preparation made for our work. At an early hour this morning, the entire cavalry corps was on the march. In order that the enemy might not be prematurely warned of our design, the several commands were ordered to make as little noise as possible. Consequently, the bugle calls were dispensed with, and commanders made use of their voices, and in some instances the orders were conveyed from rank to rank in a whisper. The three great divisions of the corps were to cross the river as follows, Greggs at Sulphur Springs, Buford's at Rappahannock Bridge, and Kilpatrick's at Kelly's Ford. At six o'clock the Harris Light plunged into the river at Kelly's Ford, leading the advance. A strong detachment of Stuart's cavalry consisting of pickets and reserves opposed our crossing with dogged pertinacity, but finally, yielding to our superior numbers and to the deadly accuracy of our carbines, gave way. 
He then advanced in the direction of Brandy Station. The farther we advanced, the stronger grew the ever-accumulating force of the enemy, who disputed every inch of ground with great stubbornness. On arriving near the station, we found the enemy in strong force, with artillery posted on the surrounding hills. We saw clearly that a third cavalry fight was destined to be fought on this historic field, and we began to make preparations for the onset. It was my fortune to lead the advance company in the first charge. Three men and four horses were killed and wounded in this company by the first discharge of the enemy's artillery, whose fire was terribly accurate. But we had not been fighting long before the other divisions joined us. At their approach, great enthusiasm among our boys prevailed. Before our combined force, the enemy was swept from those plains like chaff before the whirlwind. They fled in the direction of Culpeper, a naturally strong and now fortified position, where we knew we must soon encounter the rebel chivalry en masse upon their chosen field. From Brandy Station, General Pleasanton directed Kilpatrick to make a detour via Stevensburg, in order to operate as a flanking column upon the enemy at the proper time. With the first and second divisions, Pleasanton pushed straight on to Culpeper, driving the enemy before him without much resistance until within about a mile of the town. Here our advance was effectually checked. A fearful duel now took place with varying fortunes. For some time the enemy baffled all our efforts to dislodge him from his strong position, and our men began to look wishfully for the flankers, when lo. Kilpatrick's flags were seen advancing from the direction of Stevensburg, and his artillery was soon thundering in the enemy's flank and rear. Under this unexpected and well-directed fire, that portion of the enemy which had kept our main column at bay fell back in confusion into the town. And before they had time to reform their broken lines, the Harris Light, 5th New York, 1st Vermont, and 1st Michigan, led by General Custer, dashed upon the Johnnies in the streets, throwing the boast of the chivalry into a perfect rout. Many prisoners were captured, more or less material of war, and three Blakely guns. The rebels retreated hastily in the direction of Pony Mountain and Rapidan Bridge, whither they were closely pursued by our victorious squadrons. The day following this brilliant advance, Pleasanton occupied all the fords of the Rapidan, extending his pickets on our right as far forward as the Robertson and Hazel Rivers. The way having been thus prepared by his heroic avant couriers, General Meade advanced the Army of the Potomac across the Rappahannock and took his temporary residence in Culpeper. On the 15th, Kilpatrick's division advanced from Culpeper to Bacoon Ford on the Rapidan. Colonel Davies' brigade supported a battery of artillery a short distance from the ford from 1 till 4 p.m. The shelling from the enemy's batteries was terrific. Their position was admirable on the high bluff south of the ford, and the range was just right for execution. Their artillery was of a heavy caliber and supported by infantry. They were finely screened by earthworks, while our forces were almost entirely exposed and protected only here and there by a little knoll. In the unequal duel which took place, two of our guns were dismounted and disabled, while several artillerymen and horses were killed. It was not at all practicable for us to attempt a crossing. Before night we retired from the ford, and the divisions took up their headquarters, Gregg's at Rappahannock Bridge, Buford's at Stevensburg, and Kilpatrick's on the extreme right at James City. September 16th Today we are picketing the fords of the Robertson River, a branch of the Rapidan. At five o'clock p.m. the 5th New York pickets were attacked and driven to within a few rods of their reserve, but being reinforced by ourselves, who were ordered to relieve them, the enemy was compelled to retire hastily, and we reoccupied the line which was taken up by the 5th in the morning.